Welcome to the today's webinar brought to you by Get Response. I'm excited from all over the world. I all wanted to hear, uh, to hear our newest speaker, uh, Anna Handley, uh, talk about how to level up your writing. Uh, in just a few seconds, we'll start the presentation, but until then, uh, I hope everyone manages down comfortably, adjust the audio settings, uh, get their notepad ready to write down all the wonderful ideas you will hear uh, from Anne today. Uh, before we begin, let me just share some of the housekeeping uh, items with you uh, that will um, be um, relevant to the, today's webinar. So um, this webinar will take around 15 minutes and after we're, afterwards we'll get a chance to have a short Q&A session with Anne. So you can, uh, you, can answer, uh, you can ask your question during the webinar. Uh, we'll try to answer them on the chat uh, that you can see at the bottom left corner of the window. Uh, but also you can keep the questions for later and Anne will be answering them for you. Uh, after Anne finishes uh, her part, we'll uh, show you briefly on how to use uh, the um, just acquired knowledge uh, in marketing automation uh, live. So I'll show you uh, just how to quickly create an automation workflow. Um, we'll send you the recording uh, also uh, quite shortly, so you'll get it tomorrow by email. Um, and you're more, more than welcome to uh, tell your colleagues, tell your friends about all the things that you're learning from today's webinar uh, via, uh, via Twitter or any other social media channels that you're using. And feel free to use uh, the GR Automation Hub um, hashtag to promote this event and everything that you're going to learn today and from the Get Response Automation Hub overall. Um, so, not, not to keep you any longer, uh, waiting any longer, please welcome Anne Handley, uh, the Chief Content Officer of Marketing Profs, who will tell you more about uh, how to level up your, uh, your writing and your writing skills. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here with you today, and it's really awesome to see all of you coming from all over the world um, in the chat there. So hopefully I'm coming through loud and clear. Um, and you can you can hear me um, you can you can hear me in your in your earbuds or through your headset or or whatever. Okay, so let's jump right in here today. I want to start by saying this right up front. Why are we talking about writing in a seminar that is um, sponsored by an amazing marketing automation and email marketing company? What, what role does writing have in marketing anymore? Why do we need to think about writing ludicrously well? Why do we need to think about up, uh, upping our, our writing game? It's because that I do believe that writing is the heart of content marketing. And I believe that content is the heart of marketing automation. So the two are absolutely linked. They're absolutely entwined. And I want to talk today about, you know, why is it so important? And then more importantly, how do we actually create uh, better content through uh, by, by thinking about the, our, our writing, by upping our writing game? I guess say, saying this another way, without content, without great content, I think it's hard to make marketing automation work. Um, and without being a skilled writer, I think it's hard to make content work. So I think all those things really do play into one another. Which is why I wrote this book, Everybody Writes, is, is my, um, my last book that came out just about a year and a half ago, uh, two years ago. The thing about writing a book, you know, this, this is a book that really distills everything that I know about writing, about creating ridiculously good content um, into, into one package. But the thing about writing a book is that it makes you vulnerable. I think that's true anytime we put our ideas out there. People feel like, like you know, they can review it, they can comment on it. And it's a little bit hard as the creator to, to look at some of the feedback that you get from writing a book. So I wanted to share one bit of feedback that I got from a reader who said this. Overall, he said, I was a bit disappointed by this book. I had expectations that this book would unlock some secret writing ability within myself. Well, here's the thing. He would be disappointed because there is no secret writing ability that's locked within an individual, right? There is no secret to be unlocked. Instead, my philosophy is that writing well is a muscle 
you need to develop it. It's not like a secret thing that, that sort of gets conjured up out of some place and you can either write well or not. Instead, I think it's something that if we work on, we can develop that muscle, we can be better writers. Some of you might remember um, Dumbo, right? Famous Disney movie. This is a scene in which the crows convince Dumbo that he can fly, right? That, that his huge ears, which he was mocked for and, and which he was outcast for, um, are actually not a liability. In fact, that they're an asset. They convince him that he can fly. In the movie, Dumbo gets airborne with the help of a magic feather. You can see that little magic feather that he's holding in his trunk. But the thing was, Dumbo didn't need the feather, right? It turns out that everything he had was in him. And I think that real life isn't unlike isn't like Dumbo, right? There is no secret. What what it takes, you know, what it takes to be a better writer is some practical ideas and some tools that I want to share with you today, right? There there is no magic. So I guess if we were all together, I would ask you to just take a writer's pledge here, right? I want us all to think about um, taking a writer's pledge as the as the as the heart of what we can do. Are you guys having some audio problems? Does this make it any better? Does this make the audio a little bit better? Hopefully. Okay, someone chat me and let me know. Yeah. Okay. So I guess it's clear for some people. Some people are having audio problems. Okay, good. All right. So let's think about um, taking a writer's pledge. If we're all together. I would ask you to hold up your hands right now. If we're all together in person, I mean, I would ask you um, to hold up your hands and say, you know, that you that you do not believe in unicorns, fairies, or Santa, right? You know that bridges are not guarded by trolls. You do not wear a tinfoil hat, and there is no magic feather in writing. Again, it's really a matter of embracing some practical tools um, and really getting a sense of what is good writing and why is it important. Part of the reason why I think we have such a complex relationship with writing is that we see things like this. This is from Sports Illustrated, uh, a Sports Illustrated editor by the name of Terry McConnell, who said, nothing is more ephemeral than words. Moving them from the mind of the writer to the mind of the reader is one of the most elusive and difficult undertakings ever to challenge the human intelligence. Really? <laughs> no, I don't think it's that hard. Words are hard, but they're not this hard, right? Coal mining is definitely hard. Uh, solving for X in a math equation um, is hard. Navigating middle school is hard. Being a parent is hard. And yeah, I'm sorry, Eric, there is no Santa. I'm sorry if you're just finding this out now. I do believe that this is true, though, that writing is a process that's so mysterious and weird and fragile and confusing and specific as to be almost <laughs> impossible for any writer to fully articulate even to herself. This is by writer Danielle Dutton. I think this is absolutely true. And so part of what I'm going to be sharing today is some ideas about how to bring your writing up to a ludicrously spectacular level. But most of this is from my own perspective. So I'm going to share some tools that really work for you, for me. And I hope that you'll be able to get some, some usefulness out of this too, right? I hope you'll be able to use some of these tools as well. So the way we're going to do this today is to think about working from the bottom up, right? We're working upward. We're going to talk about not writing. We're going to talk about the ugly first draft. Um, we're going to talk about screw and do, and what does that mean? We're going to talk about the first line, and finally, we're going to talk about voice. So these are five things that I think are important to pay attention to, um, things that you can work on, I think, to take your writing to that next level. So the first thing we're going to talk about now is not writing. The thing about writing is that the most important part of writing doesn't actually look like writing. What do I mean by that? I mean that it actually looks more like prep. It looks like research. It looks like thinking. So it looks like things like reading headlines in the checkout aisle, um, or it looks like daydreaming, or, or driving, or drawing, or, or taking a shower, or listening to music, or going to the movies. All of those things are where your ideas come from. Because the thing about writing is that there is no prescription to fill, right? The way a writer works is not the way that a pharmacist works. There is no prescription that we can just check off. I can't give you guys a template. So that's awesome, right? Because it's more creative. But at the same time, it's a little scary too, because what can I write about now? 
you know, the difference between being creative and desperate is ideas, I think, right? Having a rich font to draw from. So this isn't the time to start thinking about writing. You know, a lot of us have have been in this situation where we suddenly will just see a, a blank page. You know, we have content that we have to fulfill. Sorry, I'm going to shut off this phone. Sorry about that. Um, we have content that we need to write, and, and so we start by looking at a blank page, and this is the wrong place to start. This is the thing that sort of fills your, your soul with terror, because this is not the place to start. Instead, I think that this is the place to start, right? This is sort of how I think about, um, about writing, right? Half the work of, of anything that you write that is ultimately going to be great content starts with, with prep, with research. Then the next biggest chunk there, <clears throat> as we work counterclockwise, is editing, right? That's after you've, you've done the writing, but that's the next biggest chunk. Um, and then the writing piece is, is right at the top there. And then, of course, like a lot of writers, this is what I always struggle with. There's always that hour of despair where I'm researching another career because you just think, I can't, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> so the difference between being truly creative and, and feeling desperate is having those ideas, having that rich font to draw from. So maybe some of the ideas that you'll come up with during that prep phase, during that research search phase will be crap. You'll never use them or you'll never write about them. But at the same time, I think always being open to those ideas um, is, is a good thing because you'll start to develop that muscle that will get stronger. Your, your creative side, in other words, will be buffed with ideas and you've really got to have a strong creative side in order to ultimately have a, a great font of ideas to, to work with. The squirrel, I think, is the, is the sort of spirit animal of the writer, um, because the squirrel is what a zoologist would call a scatter hoarder, in the sense that a squirrel will hoard things for winter, right? It stashes them all over your yard or, or all over your garden um, for later. The writer is very similar to that, in the sense that we hoard ideas and we stash them in different places, right? Creativity comes when you are being pre-creative, as I call it, right? When you take that intentional step to notice things, to do that hoarding, and then you stash them away for later. So make a commitment as a writer to, to sort of hoard and stash five new ideas a day. I do this every single day. I write them down every single day, five new ideas. And here are the tools that I use. I call this my triple threat scattering hoarding philosophy, right? This gathering stage, I gather my ideas in uh, either a, a Moleskine or I also use Pocket. But if you are a fan of Evernote, um, you can use that too. The point is to find a tool that really works for you. I like the idea of actually having a notebook that I can write ideas down with. I carry a pocket Moleskine everywhere I go. Um, but if I'm sort of ro you know, roaming around the internet, I'll use Pocket as a place to gather ideas too. I've never been a fan of Evernote. I know there are a lot of people who love it. Um, and if that's you, I, I salute you. <laughs> um, but the point is to find the tool that works for you. Then I do, I, then I sort those ideas and I use a tool called Trello, which essentially allows me to take those ideas, I call them ideas, um, because I sort of have developed an affection for them at this point, and I, I load them into a tool called Trello, which, which helps me sort of track and organize them. I can track them based on the ones that I want to work on now, the ones that I'm still researching, um, and, you know, and so on down the line. I think it's important to have a tool here to sort that's different than the gather tool, because this is really the stage where you decide what is what is real, what do you think is possibly real, or what do you actually want to work on, as opposed to just you know these sort of amorphous um, ideas in in the background. And then when I'm ready to actually you know write something and I'm I'm actually going to schedule it for publication, I use a tool called CoSchedule. This is not to say that you have to use CoSchedule. You can use any calendaring tool, any editorial calendaring tool. But the point here is to use one calendaring tool that, that will really work for you. So the process is really this, right? Find that question that you want to explore. Find the question that is in your brain that you're thinking about 
exploring and then research the daylights out of it. Gather as much information and data as possible to feed your, your brainstorming slash you know, content ideation process. So rather than starting with that blank slate, you have lots of research behind you. So where do I start that research? Um, I start just at Google, right? <laughs> There's no magic to this, I start at Google. Um, for this presentation, for example, I started with a basic Google search on how to write better than I normally do, normally do and this is what I came up with. What Google delivered to me with that simple sort of search was mostly productivity tips, right? So there is nothing wrong with this, but I wanted a little bit more data in science, right? I wanted to think about maybe, um, maybe I could find some studies that other writers have found. I'm always looking for data or research to back up whatever it is that I'm writing, um, because I think there are great stories that you can tease out of, of data. So I wanted sort of next level, right? I didn't want a basic Google search. So what I did is I added how to write better than I normally do plus research. You can also add a study or science or data. You can use whatever you want here. But the point is that you want to add some word to your query string to deliver more research-based ideas. So again, you can use research, study, science, you know, whatever. You want to get a little bit of the, of the story behind the story. You want to start to unearth some of those numbers. The results you're going to get from a search like this um, are going to be more concrete and they're going to be more research-based posts as opposed to posts that merely list you know, productivity tips like you'll get in a basic Google search. They are also giving me some new ideas for posts, by the way. And typically what I'll do is I'll swing by the book section on Google. Um, there's a lot, this is a great place to go if you're really looking to uncover more research. I will also swing by Google Scholar because this is a, a, the, the section of Google that will deliver the deepest and the most data-filled insight that you could possibly want. Sometimes this is overkill, but sometimes it's kind of useful to uncover you know, interesting research or data on a specific topic, again, depending on, on what your topic is. I'll also use a site called Board Reader, a tool called Board Reader. What this does is it'll search um, forums and discussion boards. It's essentially a search engine for, for those, you know, for formats or discussion boards or that kind of thing. So that'll start to unearth even more information about, you know, what is already out there. And as I'm honing in, as I'm figuring out, you know, what is my take on something going to be, you know, what is my perspective? Um, I'll also go to a tool called BuzzSumo. BuzzSumo is a, um, it's a, it's a great place to look at things like title structures and, and to find out what topics are most appealing. Um, it's straightforward, it's super easy to use. You can search the site by topic um, or by site URL. Uh, it's always a good idea, for example, to check out what your competitors' topic articles are. I find it really useful for that. So you can also look at, um, at you know, you can sort of see what has the most shares and, and that kind of thing. This is $99 a month, but it's, um, it's well worth it for a content creator who's trying to get a sense of what kinds of things are, are resonating out there. These two places, um, these two tools are really useful if, you're, if you sort of know what you want to write, you've got the question that you have in mind, you, you have a sense of what your approach is going to be. Um, so what these two tools are, they can, they can help you hone that even further. Ubersuggest is technically it's a keyword discovery tool, um, but I think it can really help you uncover unique angles on stories or, or, or give you some insight into, into things that you maybe haven't, haven't thought about. You can also look at um, blog about, which is a straight up, you know, just give you suggestions for, for unique approaches to your own particular topic. So back to our pledge for a second, I just want to re reiterate, it's really important to not think about writing at the point where you have a blank page in front of you or what you're going to write. I mean, when you have a blank page in front of you. Try to collect and hoard at least five ideas every day. I swear it will pay off. All right, our next section here is to talk about the ugly first draft. What do I mean by the ugly first draft? I mean that you can't write well without first writing spectacularly badly. I think as writers, we put too much pressure on ourselves right up front to actually write well. And so what I'm saying to you now is just let it go, right? Don't worry about whether you're writing well or not. You know, the point is to, to, just, to just write. I think it's too scary to think 
to put too much pressure on yourself, right? It's too much pressure to think, you know, you've got to come out with complete sentences, that you've got to spell correctly, that you've got to actually, you know, have a, have a, uh, have a, um, a train of thought that makes sense. You don't have to do any of that. Actually, I think it's far better to just, you know, just write whatever it is that you need, that you need to write. The other thing is sort of take the pressure off yourself. Sometimes people will get a, a sort of, um, they'll sort of have some anxiety about this. Just sitting down with a blank page is, is sometimes anxiety producing. So what I do actually is I just make a list. I just sort of like pretend that I'm just creating a grocery list, for example, only instead of writing down groceries, I'm sort of writing down the key points that I wanna cover in any particular post. I have a friend who starts every post by writing an email to himself. Right, so he avoids that blank page entirely by just firing up his his email and you know sending an email off to himself. He finds that that is a is a better way to tap into a, a looser, more conversational writing style. You can also outline an idea. There's a million different ways you can map an idea, um, or you can dictate your thoughts. You can just use your phone, or you can use any sort of you know recording device, and then have it transcribed through something like Rev.com. It's R-E-V.com. Super useful if you're the kind of person who can speak really well and, and, and more easily, but you find writing kind of difficult. I also think it's important to muzzle that inner critic, right? I think very often we tend to stop ourselves um, before we've really had a chance to, to just lean into the, the, our, our inner writer, right? So we, we, we have to sort of muzzle that inner critic, that person who's saying that what, we're, what, we're, what we have to contribute isn't worthwhile right now or, or that you know, we're, we're writing terribly today or it just feels like we're, we're sort of slogging along, right? Just muzzle that inner critic. Don't listen to him or her or whatever incarnation they, they take in your own brain. Distraction-free writing tools can be really useful for this. Um, there's a tool that I discovered recently called ILYS. I'm not really sure what it stands for. I'm thinking I love you so is how I think about it. I don't actually know what it stands for. But this tool is actually really interesting um, because to start a, a writing session, you let ILS know how many words you want to write. So here I've typed in a thousand. And then you just begin writing and there's nothing you can do but keep writing and all you see is the letter that you're typing coming up. So you can't go back, you can't delete, you can't reread anything, you can't edit anything until you've completed that word count that you plugged in at the start. And then when you have reached your goal, only then can you go back and edit your text in every way you want. So it's kind of crazy, but it forces your brain to just keep going. And it really does muzzle that inner critic um, in a really, really tangible way. All right, so back to the writer's pledge. Just remember, do not hit the backspace while you're writing. That's really the point of, of what I'm talking about here today. Don't stop yourself before you actually start. And then secondly, never go straight from writing to publishing. I think this is so important because I think we need to allow a post to sort of to sort of rest and, and ripen before we're going to get into any sort of self-editing stage. And there's a reason for that too. There's science will we'll, we'll back me up here. There's a Soviet scientist by the name of Bluma Zagarnik who, in 1927, founded this concept known in psychology as the Zagarnik effect. And the Zagarnik effect states that people remember uncompleted or uninterrupted tasks better than they remember completed tasks. So you need to let that field go fallow, so to speak. You need to let those ideas ripen overnight so you can go back to them with a renewed perspective. Now, it doesn't have to be overnight, of course, but the point is to go back to something later on. Just let it, let it rest for a little while and then go back to it. Because if you do that well, I think you can open yourself up to the opposite of deja vu, right? You know that sense of deja vu where you've already seen something? Vuja day is the opposite of that, right? So you can go from deja vu to vuja day. In other words, looking at something with a fresh perspective, with fresh eyes. All right, so the third section we're gonna talk about here today is screw and do. What do I mean by that? I think we need to find that screw and then we also need to identify the do. So the screw is one key point that's easily accessed by the reader and the do is the thing that we want our readers to do. 
often that screw is is not not obvious right away, right? The, the screw, as my friend Beth Dunn says, is the fixed point around which everything else turns. So it's the main point. You should have a single screw. You should be able to identify what that main point is, no matter what how many words are, are part of your writing project, whether it's uh, whether it's a simple blog post, whether it's an ebook, whether it's a full size book, right? You should have a central point that you're trying to make all the time. Very often, though, that 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 screw is not obvious, right? Often it's buried in the second or third paragraph. What you want to do is sort of give it center stage, right? Give that screw center stage, give that fixed point around which everything else turns, you know, the, the most oxygen. A super silly way to think about this, but I found incredibly effective, is just to delete your first or your second paragraphs. You know, very often in writing, we tend to take a running start. We tend to just start a little too far back, right? Because we're sort of trying to explain something. So look at anything that, that, you, that you are writing, right? Are you taking that running start? In other words, are you explaining too much up front before you get right into the, the points, before you get right into the screw? If so, don't, right? Delete those first few paragraphs and, and smooth it over a little bit. Make sure that you are, are stating that screw piece in one sentence right up front. And secondly, you want to think about the what's in it for your audience, right? As I call it, the with you, the what's in it for your audience. What's the thing that you want them to do? What do you want your audience to feel or think about or act on or do? This is especially important in content marketing, right? Because you don't want to be great at content. You don't just want to be writing something that's awesome. You also want to get a sense of what it is that you want your customer to do. It doesn't have to be a call to action, by the way, but it should maybe be a sense of, you know, what's the next step that you want them to take after they read this. Even if it didn't have an explicit, you know, call to action at the end, would you have a clear sense about, you know, what do you do moving on? I think the key to great content, to great writing, is also what I call pathological empathy. And this is sort of next level empathy, right? Empathy is really about getting a sense of, of who your customers are, having a sense of, of what drives them, the, 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 the pain that they have, uh, the burdens that they carry, and so on. But I think great writing and great content more broadly has pathological empathy, right? It has a it has a, a next level empathy for the folks you are trying to reach. I do this exercise all the time. I call it the so what exercise to reframe a piece of, of writing or, or a piece of content from the perspective of the reader by asking, so what? <laughs> and then answering because until you've essentially exhausted your ability to reach an answer. Right, so in a marketing context, this is really reframing your product or service as clear value for the customer. Um, and I think in writing, it's hugely, hugely useful. So just a quick example of, of um, it's sort of a silly example, actually, it's a fun example though, of a product called the Boyfriend Body Pillow, right? So what you're looking at here is a pillow that's shaped like a, a quarter of a, of a boyfriend, right? It's a pillow that you can sort of snuggle into. And the challenge that the marketers of the boyfriend body pillow had was to reframe that body pillow as a clear value for the customer. And so they asked this question of themselves over and over again until they came to this, ultimately, get the best sleep of your life with the boyfriend body pillow, pillow which offers for, firm sleeping support and world-class snuggling with no snoring, tossing, turning, or other annoying habits that an actual boyfriend might have, right? So if you go back to this so what because exercise, right, they could have just described what this pillow was about. They could have talked about the softness of the shirt. They could have talked about um, how, you know, how, how fluffy and comfortable it is. But thinking about it from the perspective of the customer is really the key. That first, le that first sentence is key. Get the best sleep of your life. That's the so what, right? That's the because that they needed. Sometimes it's hard as marketers because we are so close to our products um, and our services and the things that we're promoting. Sometimes it's hard to actually step outside of, of you know, your, own, your own mindset, right? To get that sort of pathological empathy. So here's a tool that I think is really fun for that. It's called the Up Our Five Text Editor. Um, if you just Google Up Our Five Text Editor, you'll, you'll come to it. And essentially what this does is it opens up a field 
that forces you to explain your thing, your product, your service, whatever, in the thousand most common words. So why is this so important? <laughs> because it's a really useful way of explaining to your audience, especially if you have a super technical product um, and you're trying to, to explain it to an audience that maybe is not as technical as you know the engineers who created it or subject matter experts who you're interviewing. It's a really interesting way of sort of rejiggering your brain, right? <laughs> of forcing your brain to think about things slightly differently. So just a quick example of how it works. Um, I, I try to describe, or actually, no, there's a scientist on here, I should say. It wasn't me who did this. It's a scientist who used the Upgoer 5 text editor to talk about evolution. Here's what she came to. Living things change into other, other living things very slowly. This happens because the living things are all a bit different. Some living things that are different are better at having babies than others. So more of their babies live to have babies of their own. Now, this is super straightforward, right? This is sort of elementary school straightforward, but at the same time, forcing your brain to not have the level of knowledge that it does, to sort of not have that curse of knowledge, I think can be a really, really useful thing as a writer. Okay, so you have your piece of writing. Now you figured out what that screw is, you figured out what your main point is, and you figured out what that do is you have the piece written. Here's how I think about writing. I think about it in three different ways. First, um, I self-edit by chainsaw, I call it, right? <laughs> so it's looking through to make sure that paragraphs are ordered correctly. Um, does a piece flow logically? Uh, does it create momentum for the reader? Or should I switch things around to sort of tell the, the story um, in, a, in a better, more logical way? So I call that editing by chainsaw. Second is to edit by surgical tools, right? Now you're getting into the, the, the finer pieces of a piece, right? You want to make each sentence earn its keep, and you want to make each word earn its keep. Things to think about is, are you repeating too much, right? Are you explaining too much, or are you not explaining enough? Very often, you know, I've been editing marketers and, and business owners, entrepreneurs for 25 years, and the biggest mistake that I think most of them make is that they don't realize that the reader doesn't know what they know and the reader isn't thinking what the writer is thinking, right? It sounds so subtle, but it's a mistake that I see all the time. And then finally, I self-edit for voice. You know, does this sound like me? Could it sound more like me? Does it sound like a real person with a specific point of view if you're writing for a brand? really useful to, um, idea here is just to read it out loud, right? <laughs> this is a great time to read it out loud and make sure that it sounds different. It sounds like you. I'm going to talk more about, about voice in a minute here. So our fourth writer's pledge is just to remember that we will have pathological empathy for the reader. Always think about your audience first. Always put their needs first. Now you might know, notice that I've gone through a lot of talk about editing and I've never talked about grammar, right? It's not that I don't think that grammar is important. I do think it is, but I think very often we equate good writing with good grammar. Like I talk to people all the time who say, oh, I'm just not a good writer. And typically what they mean by that is that they're not, they don't know grammar very well. So I want you to just not even think about grammar. I think ultimately the grammar is more the editor's job than it is the writer's job. And hopefully you have an editor you work with on a regular basis. Um, if you don't, I can suggest a couple of, of options here. Um, one is Hemingway app, which is something that I use all the time before I actually send anything I write to an actual human editor who I work with all the time too. Um, I'll run a piece through Hemingway app and it's really useful just for giving you that first pass. But if you don't have access to an editor, you know, it, it could function at least as something outside of, of yourself, right? After you've done the self-edit, run it through Hemingway app. There's another app that's not on here called Grammarly, which I've used from time to time. It's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y. Very similar to Hemingway app, so I use them sort of interchangeably. Um, or you can use an actual human. If you don't know a human editor, there's a site called wordy.com, which can pair you with an actual human being to edit your stuff. 
Um, I think it's a little expensive to use on a regular basis, but as a stopgap, it's it can be pretty useful. I would caution you to not use spell check <laughs> as as an editor. Don't think that spell check is going to be so sufficient because it's just not. So funny example here. You read that second sentence. This article was well organized with clear cat orgies, right? Hmm. Only the cats would be into that, right? Only the cats would be into cat orgy. So don't use spell check um, as, as the only tool that you use for, for editing. OK, let's talk about the first line here. The first line is so important. And why is it so important? Because it's really the piece that will that or it's the piece of your content, the piece of your writing that will set the tone for the what's to come. Um, and it also hook your reader into wanting to know more. It's next to the headline. I think it's the most important piece of um, of writing. So spend the necessary time on it. Spend the time coming up with a great first line. This is so true, sadly, but your readers really are looking for reasons not to read, right? So don't give them that. Instead, think about a compelling opening. I like to do, this is sort of a, a couple of suggestions for things that I do all the time. One, right up front, I'll put my reader into the story. Um, secondly, you could sort of set up a problem. Third is to set the stage with a curious point of view. You could also ask a question. Um, it's also effective to quote a crazy bit of data that makes the reader go, wait a sec, that can't possibly be true. Um, or tell a story or a personal anecdote, I think is another great way to introduce a writer or a reader to, to what it is that, that you're writing, your piece of writing. So here's an example of setting up a problem. This is from my friend Michael Brenner's Marketing Insider blog. A post on his site opened this way. Lead forms are like eyebrows. You pay attention only if they look really good or really bad. And when you think about that, that's actually true, right? Second is, uh, you could ask a question. This is from a piece that, that I wrote um, about Snapchat investing in, um, in a magazine. A messaging app investing in writing is a little baffling and weird, isn't it? In fact, yes, it is. Or from my friend Doug Kessler at, um, at the agency Velocity in, in the UK, he sets the stage with a sort of curious point of view. As a precious creative snowflake, I should probably be shitting myself about the rise of marketing operation and the supremacy of data. But it's curious, right? Well, why isn't he? It sort of compels you to keep reading. OK, so moving right along here, let's talk about voice um, really briefly. I think voice is vastly undervalued in a lot of content marketing, especially in the business to business world. So what does voice mean? Voice is how we hear the words. Like as we're reading them, we're reading in silence, but we hear the words in our head. That is voice. So more specifically, how do I think about this? I think voice defines three things. It's who you are as a, as a brand, especially, or as a company, especially if you are creating content um, as a marketer. Secondly, it's why you do what you do. And third, it's what you are like to deal with, right? So I think it incorporates all of these three things. So this is Spiceworks. Uh, Spiceworks is a community uh, that brings together IT people along with marketers. Here's how they describe themselves. IT pros get answers, even a few laughs, from fellow IT pros and get info from vendors. It all happens in a handy place, a place with a soul, where IT pros trust the marketers they meet. And then marketers approach IT pros like people, not leads. So remember what I shared with you a few minutes ago, right? Who you are, why you do what you do, and what you are like to deal with. It's all here, right? Who are they? They're stating it right up front that they'll get answers and a few laughs from fellow IT pros. Why do they do it? It's because they want to create a place where IT pros trust the marketers they meet, right? So that's why they do what they do. And then what are they like to deal with? They take a very human approach to their communications. So marketers approach IT pros like people, not leads, right? That's all their voice, essentially. Voice is not just copywriting, right? Instead, it's more, it's, it's more than that. It's essentially how you do the work, right? I always challenge myself with this. If the label falls off, you know, 
do you know it's yours or do you sound like everybody else? So look at your content or look at your blog posts or your, your white papers or any written piece of content. If the label fell off, for, so for example, if you were to cover up um, the, the logo on your particular piece of writing, on that piece of content, would you know it's yours? Do you recognize you? This is a really powerful exercise, by the way, to do with your executive team or your CEO or your client if they are doubting the, the value of coming up with, with a unique voice. Because very often, you know, in a, in a company that hasn't thought about their voice in the past, very often they do sound just like everybody else. So Spiceworks thinks about their tone of voice like this. They think of it as spicy. And here's what it stands for. It's snappy and upbeat. It's personal. They always use I as opposed to the organization or they. They're very creative in how they approach um, and how they approach their content and how they approach their, their writing and their tone of voice. Um, and again, they're always talking to you, the individual, right? They're not talking to the, the company or the organization. They're, they're using I and you and we. So you might be thinking, you know, well, that's not us. We're not spicy like that, or we're not even, you know, fun or creative or oddball or, or flippy or any of those things, right? I'm not saying you have to be that, but I'm asking you to think about the attributes that do best define you. I think of it as kind of a marketing mad lib. If, if you know that, that kid's book where you can go through and, and fill the blank spaces in to, you know, put in nouns and adjectives and adverbs and, and, um, and verbs to tell a story. The marketing Mad Lib, though, asks you to think about three attributes, the three adjectives that best describe you. My friends at Uberflip did this. Uberflip is a content marketing platform. They went through this exercise and came up with these three things to describe themselves. They are cheeky, they are accessible, and they are progressive, is, here's how, here, is how they think about it. Then they did something that I love. They took it to the next level and wrote about each characteristic. They defined each characteristic described it. So cheeky means that we have a personality and we're not afraid to show it. And then how do they achieve that? How do they actually achieve cheeky? That means that they use humor, they use a casual way of writing, and they remain personable. So they went through with each one of these. And then they took the whole thing and they put it online in their Uberflip brand, Uber Flip brand and style guide. Um, if you want to dig into this a little bit more, maybe use it as a, as a model for your own tone of voice guide. You can go to uh, styleguide.uberflip.com and, um, and you can see it, see it there in its glory. I particularly love this. They call it Uberflipanese. So what this includes is the sort of jargon or the glosser of words that, that they use frequently that are sort of jargony in the, in the, um, more broadly. But at the same time, they sort of signal to their audience that they understand their challenges, they understand their problems. Um, why do I think this is important? Because I think that jargon is something that, you know, we think that we need to take a hard line against. Like, no, we can't ever use jargon, we can't ever use buzzwords. But I don't think that's the case. I think that actually jargon and buzzwords are like cholesterol, right? There's a good kind and there's a bad kind. And so I think if you define the words that signal us as an insider, that's the good kind and then let go of everything else. And by the way, I really love that Uberflip put this online in its brand and style guide for a couple of reasons. One, because it makes them accountable. So everything that they write is, is, um, is they, they can judge it against what they are putting out there publicly. So it makes them accountable to themselves as well as, well as to their audience. Um, and it also makes it really accessible. So if you have a lot of people who are creating content for your own organization, a lot of people who are writing, it allows them to access it in a way that's really clear um, and just available. You can convey voice through all of these things. The tone that I just talked about, your word choice, you know, short, punchy words as opposed to longer words, sent in paragraph length is something to think about when you're thinking about your tone of voice, um, using analogy, um, and then also just the, how accessible something feels. Um, there's a lot of tools that can help you figure out how accessible something is. If you use Word to write, for example, baked into that is something called the Fleisch Kincaid Reader. Um, and you can click on it and figure it out at what level, you know, is, is your, is your um, particular piece of writing. Is it at eighth grade level or is it postgraduate level? So depending on your brand and your defined tone of voice and your audience and so on, you can figure out how accessible is this to our audience. 
So Truffle Pig is another company who I think does a really great job um, with their tone of voice. What Truffle Pig does is they they are a travel company who who um, who has excursions for you know groups of people. Here's a, a site. For, here's a, some of their commonly asked questions. This is their FAQ page. On this page, it says, "Can I just plan the trip myself?" And here's how Truffle Pig answers that. In theory, anyone can plan any trip, just as anyone can build their own house or fix their own car. It's not neuroscience, but planning takes know-how, experience, context, and a lot of time, <laughs> right? So, you know, they're a little snarky in here. They're saying, well, in theory, anybody can. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science, but, you know, here's the deal. So they're sort of um, slightly, I don't know, slightly uppity, right, a little bit. That's intentional. Gregory Sachs, um, who is a principal at Truffle Pig, said that their tone of voice is a beacon of sorts. They want to attract the right kind of people who will prize their expertise and professionalism and appreciate that it's delivered with a heaping of playfulness and quirk. Right. And so they could have just answered that pretty straightforwardly, but instead they chose to use tone of voice as a way to, to both attract people to them who will be a good fit for Truffle Pig as well as repel those who will not be a good fit for them. I just want to give a shout out here and say, like, don't ever forsake substance for style, though. Right? You always want to make sure that your content is substantive. That's why I spent so much time at the beginning talking about research for something. You want to have character. Character is good. But the moment that we let character overwhelm the content, I think, you know, we've lost. I love how Slack thinks about their tone of voice. Slack is a, com a team communication tool. They are sort of a poster child for a company that does tone of voice really, really well and uses it to their advantage. But here's how they think about it. If you work for Slack, you are the Slack voice. You're not doing a quote unquote impression of the Slack voice. You bring yourself, your experiences, your skill, and you write with shared characteristics of value and of values. And here's how the, they define them. Empathy, courtesy, playfulness, craftsmanship. Find the joy in words and own them. So in that way, Slack is saying, here's who we are, but you bring yourself to it too. Our tone of voice is essentially um, like, like bumpers along a, a roadway or, a, or along a bowling lane, right? It'll sort of keep you from, keep you out of the gutter, so to speak. Okay, so finishing up here, remember that all these things are so important that to think about collecting and hoarding five ideas every day. Don't hit the backspace while you're writing, right? Give yourself permission to write badly. Editing is so important. Don't go straight from writing to publishing. Always give yourself and your piece that time to, to sort of um, ripen, right? Remember the Zagernik effect. Always have pathological, pathological empathy for the reader. Think about everything about your reader first. Your audience is everything. And then use tone of voice to not sound like everybody else as well, right? And most of all, remember that there is no magic feather. <laughs> so thanks so much for your, your time today. Um, it's been really fun talking to all of you. And I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to really look at the, um, look at the chat on the left. It was super distracting to me, unfortunately. So um, hopefully we'll have a chance to get to some questions. But before that, I'm going to turn it back over to get response for a few minutes. All right. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we've just heard some fantastic tips and ideas, and we all got some good laughs. Uh, please do remember that you can ask the questions as we keep on talking. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, presentation, uh, we'll just now quickly jump to uh, try to put into action all the wonderful ideas that we, uh, we've just learned about uh, how to make our writing better. So uh, when it comes to communication, you sometimes write ebooks, write articles, etc., and you'd like to promote them uh, as you go along. You want to create better communication to send out uh, your messages at the right time to the right people, and this is what you can do uh, with marketing automation. And so, just to briefly tell you what marketing automation is, in essence, it is a system that allows you to uh, contact your audience, create their um, communication experience. Uh, better because you put together conditions, actions, and filters so you can decide on when your audience will get a particular types of messages and what type of messages they will get and when will it happen. So every single user that you have might get a different uh, different type of communication at different times uh, based on how you come up with your 
communication workflows. And just to give you a brief idea on how you could use it, just imagine that, uh, for example, uh, you have a website um, where you can sign up for, for a free trial, but you can also have a paid account or you have different uh, types of paid accounts, like, like with GetResponse. So what you could do is uh, get on board your users and uh, mark the moment when someone signs up, but look at the websites that the person is going to check out. If they're checking out uh, cards, uh, landing pages or websites that are uh, related to more enterprise level uh, features, perhaps you could contact them with the information uh, accordingly. So you could pass on that information to your sales team and so on. Or you could do something else and, for example, promote an ebook. And uh, as, as, a, as you go along, uh, you could be sending out different messages uh, based on what they do, whether they see this ebook, whether they visit the page, etc., or not. So let's see live how we can do this. So, so let's just, just give me a second, I'll uh, share my screen with you. So hopefully. Uh, you should see it in a few seconds. As soon as you're able to see the screen, I'm going to show you how you can do this. Okay, so if you go to get response, for example, uh, your marketing automation provider, all you have to do is a create a quick workflow. So let's say that you've just created an ebook. You want to promote it to your audience. So you, what you want to do is schedule a message send out a message, let's say tomorrow, that your new ebook is out. All you have to do is start off with your workflow. Here, as you can see, are some helpful tips that can show you uh, how you can create a workflow yourself. So what you have to do is quickly start the workflow. Okay, let's say new publication, and it's going to start whenever someone is sent a message. So you're sending, a message, sending out a message tomorrow that your new ebook is out. And as soon as you send that message, certain things can happen. So, for example, you're going to uh, want to know who opens the message. So, you check the basic condition, which is, was the message open? And you, you connect the dots. And then, whenever the message that you choose here is going to be open, some, something else can happen. So, let's say a specific message. Uh, okay, our new e newest ebook has just come out. Okay, so uh, you're checking if the of the message was open, and if it wasn't, what well, let's let's um, let's check if this is going to happen. Let's say we're going to wait for three days. Um, if the specific message is not open within three days, you can send out a different message to the people that didn't open it. Perhaps try out a different copy or a different time. Uh, try out something else that might might convince them to open the message. Perhaps. Uh, it wasn't something that was interesting them. So let's say become a better marketer instead of uh, our, our new, newest ebook is out. Okay, so let's say that this is the end of the moment uh, of the negative path. So what happens to people that don't open it? Well, of course, you could add them a tag after a few days. If they don't open a message, it seems that they're not interested in, uh, in your newest ebook or the ebook um, subject. So, but let's just skip that part. So what happens when people do open that message? Of course, you want to find out if they actually clicked on the link. So what you do is drag this element and click here. So if there's a, let's say, a download, uh, download link or link to your landing page, you check if they have opened that link. If not, then let's say it, it seems that, um, that the message was open, but they were not interested in what you had to uh, you have to provide in that message. So you can assign them a tag not interested in that particular, so which you can do here. But if they do click the link, we want to contact the people that are really interested in what we do. So let's, let's say they did, they did click a link and they went to your website. So you're checking whether they have went, uh, whether they've gone to your web. Uh, you provide the link here. And then if they have seen the website, which is, for example, a thank you page for after downloading the ebook, you can wait a few more days. Let's say uh, we're going to wait a few more days um, and then assign them a tag. Someone is interested in, in uh, our topics. And let's say we're going to ass uh, assign that tag and we're going to send them a message within two more days uh, trying to persuade them to either download another ebook or join us for a webinar or schedule a demo and so on. 
So this is how you could do it quickly um, whenever you have a prepared uh, campaign, whenever you're publishing a new ebook or something else. As I said uh, before, you can use it for any, uh, any sort of um, promotional campaign that you're doing. You're just uh, mixing and adding the blocks together. It's as simple as that. Um, so, just as, uh, as I said, I wanted to briefly show you how you can do it. Now you can go back to the Q&A session and if you have any questions for, uh, for Anne, please feel free to ask them. I'm going to make the chat pod bigger so we can see the questions uh, better. Um, and, and as I said, I'm, I'm going to switch off my microphone for a few minutes and passing the, the sound to Anne. Do feel free to ask the questions. I can see that some of the questions are related to GetResponse platform. Of course, we'll try to answer them on a chat. Uh, but since we have Anna here, uh, she's an expert on, on marketing, on copywriting, on writing. So this is your chance to ask her any questions to, to writing towards better, becoming a better marketer. So feel free to ask the questions right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. I'll do my best here to try to try to uh, <laughs> answer a few of these. Um, let me see. So Imran is asking, how should he structure blogs um, before you write them? Um, you know, I'm a big fan with of of uh, sort of making that grocery list, like I mentioned, just making a list of all the key points that you wanna that you wanna cover in a particular blog with an eye toward just having a single point, right? That was the screw that I talked about um, that you want to make. And then the supporting points would be underneath that. So um, we talked, I talked about this in Content Rules, which is my first book, and, and I gave a sort of, um, I don't know, outline, I guess, for a blog post. But just to sort of reiterate it here, it's, you know, coming up with that, that one thing that you want to talk about, that one screw, that one point that you want to make. Um, and then add three, at least three supporting points below that with the most important one first and the least important one third. Um, so that's just a quick, easy way to think about writing a blog post. Um, but again, you know, there, there's no single way to write, you know, just like there's no single way to, to raise a child, right? And so you've got to find what works for you. But if you feel a little bit like you're not sure where to start, I think that that template can probably offer you um, as a sort of easy access point. Um, I'll try to post that template actually in the, uh, in the chat here. Okay, um, let me see what else do we have here. Sue Ann, you're hilarious. Sue Ann is my friend. Are you freezing in the tiny house about now? No, I have heat in the tiny house, Sue Ann. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I have a tiny house that's um, behind my actual house that I write in. It's sort of a sacred writing space. I also do webinars from here because it's a quiet space. Um, and so it's just, it's a pretty efficient place, I think, to, to write. Writing in places like coffee shops don't, don't work for me. It's just too noisy, too distracting. So um, I need silence. Um, let me see here. Um, Gwen, how do you get a copy of my book? You can actually get it on Amazon and get it really essentially anywhere, um, anywhere books are sold. Essentially, thanks for that. I, I couldn't have teed that question better up myself. <laughs> um, let me see here. Alex is offering, can I use these tools for Spanish? Huh, that's a good question. I don't know about that. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, certainly some of them I would expect yes, um, but I don't know. I guess you would just have to experiment and figure out if it if it works for you. I don't I don't have a clean answer to that. Sorry, since I don't write in Spanish. Okay, and actually, I think you all will be getting a copy of the of the recording after this. So if you came in late and you missed the um, my favorite slide, which was the very first slide, then um, then definitely you'll be getting a copy of it. 
So, all, right. all right. Yeah, we'll be getting a copy. So I can see that no more questions are coming up. Uh, in case you do have any questions, I'm going to go back to the slide uh, slide view so you can see Anne Hanley's uh, details. And you can always reach out to us as well. You can check out our blog, blog.getresponse.com. And thank you, Anne. It was wonderful having you here. And I've learned a lot myself. And I'm going to use all that information uh, in my newest articles or ebooks. And I'm sure everyone has learned a lot and they've enjoyed this presentation. So thank you for coming here. And all of you, thank you for joining us, uh, whether it's early or late, uh, for this webinar. As I said, we'll, everyone will be getting their recording uh, shortly, get it tomorrow. So uh, speak to you soon. Have a great day, evening, or afternoon. Bye.